has been a tale of several stories economically lately. Vietnam is booming. Singapore dodged a recession. China is struggling at the moment. The economy didn't get the bounce from the COVID reopening that many had expected. There's also the issue with the property values and possible deflation. With me is Peter Chun, the founder and at uh, Silver Bear Capital, and uh, with some very timely information. So I feel like China's in the news about every day here. And you're based in Hong Kong. So tell me, what do you see on the ground? Well, um, obviously, um, this year's Chinese number are not particularly um, up to expectation. So um, despite the government strong intervention into the economy, um, and despite that, they actually um, double time uh, reduced their banking reserve just to allow more lending power into the economy didn't really help so far. So um, Hong Kong being part of China, obviously, will um, be carried forward in the same direction um, slightly. And despite the, the weak um, capital market uh, performances, and there's no big IPOs going on at the, at the moment. So uh, yes, Hong Kong is uh, definitely um, going to uh, probably need to be a bit more patient uh, with the economy coming back. What do you think was behind China not bouncing back as much as people expected? Um, Julie, because um, there is the mixture of chemistry about their, the, the, the whole Chinese economy is based on um, property market for the last 10 years. And it was also um, the central government policies to limit um, the expansion of property because um, they would like to actually um, wanted to control, um, I would say, the bubble, as to call. So uh, especially a, lot, a few large um, uh, property developers is actually defaulting on, on their credits as well. So I think the, um, the, the, although there is um, a lending um, uh, atmosphere in China, it didn't really go to the property market, which, base, um, uh, the, the, which is basing the economy um, as, as the foothold. And because the foothold is not being supported well, and therefore actually this this actually will will get carried forward with with all these negative sentiments uh, in the market space. Was it just too much optimism? You think rebuilding? I mean, we see that happen here. Um, you know, people overbuild and prices go down. I mean, what was kind of behind that huge property growth that we saw over the past fifteen years? Really? Well, the property and then obviously the exports, um, everything was working out in, in Chinese favor uh, at a particular point of time. The manufacturing went well. Um, um, everything seems to be in the right direction. And obviously, um, every year they have reported a very strong growth um, due to um, how everybody was arguing, how China was calculating their GDP um, with their accounting mag magic principle that they used. And um, these two years, obviously, um, the, the precedents have actually, did, have actually um, made certain progress into adjusting how they calculate GDP. So what they're claiming is this GDP number is a little bit more catered towards international standard now. I see, okay. And there was also the youth unemployment issue. It's about 20%. So what's going on with the young people and why they don't want to work or, I mean, what, what's happening there? The problem carry forward um, probably have extended even back towards 20 years ago when um, farming, manufacturing was, was the key element uh, for, for the growth uh, in China infrastructures. Um, but however, the, the, the reason younger people are more educated so they're not exactly the farmer type personnel. They're not like a factory worker yeah. point of view. So they don't have that point of view of like working in those industries. So they probably, this is one of those transformational gap that um, the population needs to probably be able to adapt. So um, the economy needs to start providing more surfacing jobs more, um, uh, I would say, te technology jobs for these younger people, which the economy needs time to catch up. Now, we just had uh, the Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, just came back from China, and um, it seemed like a pretty positive trip. In fact, um, the Ministry of Commerce in China said that restoring stability in the U.S.-China trade relations is the best way to de-risk. 
So I felt like that was kind of a, a nice move forward. What do you think of that? I remember um, going back um, a couple of years ago when everybody was uh, speculating about the Chinese-U.S. relationships, especially started with the trade war. Uh, we didn't expect the, the, the conflict had, had extended for so many years now. And uh, it's, it's so, we're so delighted to, to actually to see that there's actually some progress um, on, the front, on the front end now. So I think um, I would totally agree with you. You know, this is, uh, you know, absolutely probably uh, a, a very good signal um, uh, from, from both parties saying, okay, well, finally they had kind of put their, put themselves in, in, into, into um, a format whereby they know this needs to be resolved. Well, and it feels like the two largest economies in the world it feels like it's better for everybody if things are, you know, everybody gets along and <laughs> works together on these things. Absolutely. And what about consumer spending? I know that's one thing China is known as such great savers of money, something we're not so great at in the U.S., but um, is there a way that the government could boost consumer spending and help give the economy a jolt? They did try. Um, obviously, after COVID, um, there is um, uh, the 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 government intervention about how they would be able to encourage uh, 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 spending uh, power uh, internally, especially in China. And obviously uh, what ha really happened this year was um, everybody was using their saving to pay back the debt during COVID. So um, it's kind of the Chinese probably uh, population sentiment to, to actually try to pay off what they own before first, before they try to spend. And obviously um, I guess, um, it was a long COVID, and uh, the retail had been um, harshly um, hit in China. So um, that would affect again the the employment rate because you know obviously the retail all, all obviously hire quite a number of percentage of the population to just run to run it. So I think it's it's back in a circle all the time to 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 to, to come through. Um, with a result that basically the Chinese government is saying, wow, okay, well, yeah, I, I can understand this, but um, the question lies here is, um, is it retail that, that they needed to push or why the online world that is supposed to not be affected is still slow compared to the other days? So I think, um, I think going forward, uh, it will probably take one or two years for, for the economy to, to come back to its kind of a normal spending uh, level. Um, so that's, this, this adjustment probably needs to happen. Yeah. Do you think the China-West relationship will come back? If so, what do you think that might look like? I, we have always thought it would come back because um, uh, despite whatever conflict that um, each other probably point of view have, have been given to be, to be seen, um, to a largest economy, if they're not working together, then um, it would probably be, um, be um, I, I wouldn't say it was a mistake, but it would be, it would be a, a, an unfortunate thing for, for everybody um, who's actually engaged in this international ecosystem of trade. So I, I'm, I'm sure um, uh, everybody and every member of, 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 the, of, of this world would probably want, want this conflict to be, to, be, to be softened, if not resolved completely in, in, in the new future. You also do some investments in other parts of Asia. <laughs> we spent a lot of time talking about China, but Singapore, Vietnam, Thailand. I mean, talk about what you see in some of these other countries. Well, Indonesia uh, in India is, is coming strong. Um, and we, we, we saw quite a number of strong IPOs from Indonesia, um, taking Indonesia to um, number four in, in the Southeast Asia capital market ranking. Um, the, the, I guess it's a mixture of the geopolitical um, uh, handling policies uh, and the, the strong population that they have and everything. Uh, in that region is, is kind of very reasonably priced. So there is a lot of upside there. In India, especially with the, with the strong population, um, we saw a number of Yunnan Khans uh, in India coming through. 
Um, so they 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 made they made um, a pretty good um, um, headway uh, with for themselves. Uh, Vietnam, we saw um, a EV company coming through uh, to right. the U.S. Did pretty okay. They had a nice IPO. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Finally. And um, they've taken over some manufacturing. I think App is an Apple moving some of its manufacturing to Vietnam. As exactly. Well. Yeah. Yep. Kind of diversify a little bit. So, just some final thoughts. I mean, what are your thoughts going forward as an investor in that part of the world? What are you looking at, and what are some industries that you think really have a lot of potential? Um. The emerging market is, is still where we want to position ourselves. So um, the, the the fintech, anything with cell phones, correlated. Um, entertainment is actually doing pretty okay in Southeast Asia. So um, we we see um, a lot of the um, uh, content uh, market coming back. Um, an argument about ESG, we still believe in it. By the way, no matter what, um, I think it's, it's a must to do um, scenario. So you're seeing some of the debate about that, like we are here. Yes. ESG is kind of pop political and, you know. It's, yeah, yeah. It, it must be done. Yeah. It must be done. Um, and um, we, we are seeing um, a lot of, um, I would say, uh, resources mm -hmm. movement because um, when we when have we have witness actually in Indonesia and all these IPOs are actually resources companies that had gone IPO. Yeah. Well, doesn't Indonesia have a lot of um, like like uh, kind of the natural resources for electric vehicles? Um, is it lithium or what do they have a lot of? Uh, I think they have a lot of coal, which they okay. export to China, which is not ESG. Not ESG. <laughs> But uh, some clever um, company did go to Indonesia and started to turn coal into gas. So that helped. Um, the, uh, this copper uh, and there's other uh, small minerals, I, but, but they, they are uh, rich in, in mineral resources um, country. So I think that, that also helped them to, to be kind of the, the, the first mover in the recovery after COVID as well. Um, I think um, also commodities, food is important. Um, I think the agriculture is, is going to probably come back because I think everybody's into sustainable agriculture now. Um, so I think the, 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 um, the sentiment um, towards um, investment is still kind of those areas I just described uh, for, for the time being. Technology is staying semiconducting is absolutely uh, some of the things that, that we have uh, put our focus on. Yeah. And it feels like after COVID, things are kind of starting to normalize a little bit worldwide. We're starting to see the job market get back in balance and certain things, it's been three years, but it feels like things are normalizing. So, yes. Yeah. Peter, thank you so much. Always great to get your insight to what's going on in Asia. Thank you. Thanks.